Hello, hello, Simon's Rock. How are we doing today? Happy Friday! It's the end of March. Things are blooming. It's not gloomy outside. That's nice. So thank you guys all so much for being here. This is our keynote to kick off our Pride Week. We have a woo! Cheer for the gays! Woo! <laughs> Um, we have a wonderful lineup of events next week, so please be on the lookout in your emails for all things here, all things queer. It's amazing. We're so excited. We've got Dolly Drag tomorrow. Make sure to join us for Drag Story Hour tomorrow. Um, it's at the library. It's fun. Drag queens reading books. Need I say less? Need I say more? <laughs> um, okay. So Kyle Velty is the Associate Dean for Faculty Professor and Carlitz Chair um, in Evidence Law, the intersection of sexuality, gender, and race to provide insight into contemporary legal debates and current normative questions surrounding LGBTQIA+, gender, and racial civil rights issues. Her articles have appeared in many top law journals, including Minnesota Law Review, Yale Law and Policy Review, Cardoza Law Review, and Connecticut Law Review. She filed amicus briefs in the United States Supreme Court case of United States versus Windsor, Obergefell versus Hodges, Masterpiece Cake Shop versus Colorado Civil Rights Commission, RG and GR Harris Funeral Home Incorporated versus Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, and Fulton versus the City of Philadelphia. She has appeared in the media such as US Today and NPR. And now, you lovely llamas, please join me in introducing Dr. Kyle Velty. Thank you for the wonderful introduction. Uh, I'm so pleased to be here. Thanks for the warm welcome from all of you on campus. Um, I'm thrilled to be here. Um, I'm not a doctor. I don't have a PhD, so I appreciate the, uh, the upgrade in honorifics and the promotion that I just received. So um, I'll take the honorary PhD for, the, for today. Um, okay, so I'm here. I'm going to spend about an hour talking about um, the legal minefield for LGBTQ people um, and also what you can do about it. Uh, and then um, save about 15 minutes for questions. Um, before we jump into the substance of today, just a couple of housekeeping type items. Um, this is a really big area of law. I devote a three credit course over 14 weeks of a semester to what we're going to condense down to about 60 minutes. Um, so we're going to do basically a drive by of the hot topics in LGBTQ civil rights right now. Um, and then we can use the Q&A to drill down to specific questions you have or interests you have in certain areas that I cover. Um, also, I'm going to use an acronym um, over and over, SOGI, S-O-G-I, which stands for Sexual Orientation and Gender Identity. It's a lot quicker than saying Sexual Orientation and Gender Identity many times over the next hour, so that's SOGI. Um, I also want to say that I'm going to be talking about the religious right quite a bit, and I'm always cautious about using that term without taking just a minute to explain it. Um, I am using it as a term of art in uh, legal and political movements, uh, where it is a particular, uh, a particular political organization uh, and social movement that is really trying to roll back LGBTQ rights. And um, I want to acknowledge that there are many people of faith and many faith traditions that support equality, uh, even LGBTQ equality, uh, and many people of faith who are queer themselves. And so uh, when I say the religious right, I am by no means trying to sweep in all people of faith or all religions, but I'm really pinpointing a particular political group uh, that has a particular agenda uh, at, before the United States Supreme Court and the state legislatures around the country. Um, so with that, um, let me get my clicker and um, show you my roadmap for where we're going to go over the next hour together. I want to start with talking about marriage and why it's not the ultimate. Uh, many people, I think, think it was, and why it won't save us uh, from the onslaught of retrenchment that's happening uh, these days. Um, then I'm going to talk a little bit about, well, we have marriage, so what's the problem? Uh, and we'll talk about the um, continuing pervasive uh, discrimination against LGBTQ people um, around the country. Uh, then we'll talk about, in particular, anti-transgender legislation, uh, which is kind of where it's at right now for the religious right. Um, and those are heading quickly to the US Supreme Court, some of those challenges. And then I'm going to end by talking about um, a topic uh, called religious exemptions, which is uh, where um, 
particular vendors, like wedding vendors, um, say that they don't want to follow state law, which often says you can't turn away customers because of their race or sex or sexual orientation. Um, and some of these wedding vendors who are grounded in a particular faith uh, about what marriage is seek to turn away same-sex couples and say, I'm not going to photograph your wedding or sell you your wedding cake. Um, and and what, is, what is going on with that these days? So that's our roadmap um, and where we're headed together. Um, so let's start, uh, let's start with marriage. It's coming up almost a decade. It's been about nine years since the U.S. Supreme Court in Obergefell versus Hodges um, said that uh, same-sex couples um, must be allowed to share in the constitutional right to marry. Um, and for many in the community, it was a really high water mark. It had been um, a decades-long fight to get the right to marry. Um, and uh, many people thought, including a lot of people outside of the queer community, we have arrived, right? It is over. We are done. We have reached the mountaintop. And ha, we can take a rest. Um, but that's not really, that's not really right. Um, first of all, because the court's decision was very, very narrow. Um, it could have been expansive and said things like, any law that tries to talk about sexual orientation um, is presumptively unconstitutional. But it didn't do that. It said, listen, we have for many, many decades said that marriage is a fundamental right. And of course, we get it. M most people thought it was always just a man and a woman. But because it's a fundamental right that's already established, same-sex couples have to have the right to jump into that little box. Um, and so it was a very, very narrow constitutional ruling that didn't have much um, impact outside of the marriage right itself. Not diminishing the importance of marriage and the rights that come with it, but it was very cabined in and didn't leave a lot of room to argue for the expansion of other kinds of rights, like employment rights, for example. Um, so it was doctrinally narrow, is one of the reasons it's not the pinnacle of where we need to be uh, as the queer movement, but also because of the backlash. Um, very soon after Obergefell, we started to see wedding vendors trying to contravene state law and say, I know the state law says I can't turn people away based on their soji, but I want to anyways because I get an exemption. I get to pick and choose the laws I follow based on my faith. Uh, and we'll drill down on that a little bit more uh, in a few minutes. Um, and so we started seeing a lot of um, requests for religious exemptions from general laws. Um, and we started, oops, we started to see um, the rise of groups like the Alliance Defending Freedom, uh, which is a legal advocacy organization uh, that is, um, has as its um, goal the creation of quasi-theocratic zones of exemption um, in the United States. Uh, and they have been um, incredibly successful in their litigation tactics um, and their wins at the Supreme Court. Uh, and we'll talk about those. Uh, so narrow doctrinal holding, big backlash, means that marriage isn't the end. In many ways, marriage is just the beginning. Um, so persistence of discrimination um, since marriage and even right before marriage. Um, even after Obergefell in 2015, the queer community experiences discrimination at um, at levels that are just not comparable uh, to uh, cis and straight uh, counterparts. And this is true in virtually every setting. Healthcare, employment, housing, public spaces. And it has substantial um, adverse effects on queer people, on their economic well-being, on their physical well-being, on their mental health and well-being. Um, add into that things like racism, ableism, homophobia, transphobia. Um, people of uh, people with disabilities, uh, and it compounds the t discriminations with with those of us who walk through the world with intersectional identities. Uh, we're not just queer people; but we have other identities, um, and so discrimination persists. And part of the problem is this: um, this this is a, these are maps that are done by this wonderful group called the Movement Advancement Project. You can find that on our website whenever you need to know what's the status of a queer rights issue. And you can see that, that each map has got a heading over it. We've got employment, we've got housing, we've got public accommodations, education, credit, and health care. And the dark green is where we have protective laws for queer people. Um, and the lighter you get, the less protections there are. And so what hopefully is jumping out to you here is that, wow, your right to hold a job, to buy a house, to go to school, to get a loan, depend on where you live. And a lot of people who aren't steeped in this like I am find that surprising, that there's a patchwork of protection in the United States. Uh, and it really depends where you live uh, about whether the rights that you have. Um, and so there are gaps among the state laws because at this moment in time, there is not a single federal law that offers comprehensive protection nationally for LGBTQ people. That's why it matters on where you live because the only 
the, not the only, the largest protections that queer people have from all discrimination in all six of these realms of life is state law. And so if you don't live in a state with a progressive legislature or an equality-minded legislature, then you're largely out of luck if you get fired from your job, for example, or if you get turned away from housing or turned away um, from a doctor's office, which is a public accommodation, because there is no federal law that is expansive, not yet. And you can see on the right-hand side, there's an all green map, and that's what the country would look like if the Equality Act were passed. It has been, in some form or fashion, um, uh, introduced in Congress since 1972. And that's a long time. I was a year old, and I won't tell you how old I am. Um, a long time we've been trying to get some federal protections. It started narrowly with, let's just say you can't get fired for being gay. That was the original 1972 version. After Obergefell, uh, many in the LGBTQ civil rights movement said marriage is not enough, for the reasons I've talked about, and said, let's get a federal law. Now's the time. The country has largely accepted marriage. If you see the polling today, it's much, much higher in support than it was even 10 years ago. But if we get the Equality Act, it would amend all the current federal anti-discrimination statutes that cover all six of these areas of life and include SOGI in them. It has been in Congress since 2015 and it still hasn't gotten out of, of Congress to get to the president's desk. Uh, it is log jammed um, in, in Congress. So we still don't have federal protection and we have a patchwork of protections. So a few, st a few um, stats to share in some of these buckets that I've talked about. Um, employment, recent surveys show that half of respondents have suffered some kind of discrimination in the past year because of their SOGI. They were either fired or denied a promotion, physically, physically harassed or sexually harassed. When it comes to housing, three in 10 survey respondents suffered housing discrimination because of SOGI, um, prevented from buying a house or renting a house, um, denied access to a homeless shelter, for example, uh, harassment from neighbors or from uh, housemates. Um, four in five adults uh, in this survey took at least one action in their daily lives to stay closeted because it was safer than being who they are uh, in the world. In the healthcare realm, one in five postpone or avoid medical treatment uh, because of disrespect or discrimination from healthcare providers, including one in three transgender people. Uh, one in three postpone or avoid medical care because of the cost. And we see an intersection between things like employment discrimination and healthcare. Right? If you lose a job or you're underemployed because of discrimination, you either have bad health care or none at all. And if you have none at all or bad health care, you put off care and overlap that with provider discrimination and harassment. Uh, and it's a recipe for poor health outcomes uh, for queer and trans people. Uh, so all of these kind of intersect uh, amongst each other. When it comes to education, looking at K through 12 context, um, trans students in particular, 54% um, report verbal harassment. Over half are not allowed to dress in a way that reflects their gender identity. Um, a quarter of them are, are attacked physically because people suspect they're transgender. 20% uh, uh, believe that they are um, uh, disciplined more harshly because of their gender identity. 13% um, report being sexually assaulted by people because they were thought to be transgender by their attackers. Um, so it is not a pretty, uh, a pretty sight in many, many K through 12 schools um, around the country. When it comes to credit, some of you might be wondering, what, what does that mean? What's the discrimination there? Uh, some studies show that same-sex couples are 73% more likely to encounter a higher degree of mortgage application um, rejections or higher interest charges and interest rates or fees associated with their mortgages. Same with car loans and credit cards. The Equality Act would fix that and say you can't discriminate in credit based on SOGI. Uh, and it's a major um, it's a major obstacle to wealth creation, um, these kinds of uh, credit discriminatory practices here. And setting aside the actual kind of bad law that gets on the books, even in those states like mine, I live in Kansas, often we have our red legislature pass very bad anti-LGBTQ laws, but we have a Democratic governor who often vetoes it. So we often don't end up with the bad law on the books, but there's been a lot of research in the area of psychology and social work that just the debate itself, just it being in the news, just trans people having to hear about their lives being contested is deeply, deeply um, damaging. Um, half of a recent uh, respondents to a recent survey talked about the debates themselves affecting their mental health, making them feel less safe. 
86% of non-binary people said, yeah, I feel less safe just knowing that legislators are talking about my life in that way, regardless of the outcome of whether the law was passed uh, or vetoed or, or neither one. So this is why we need the Equality Act. It would amend, like I say, many, many federal statutes to be protective of rights that many people, I think, think is already protected for LGBTQ people, right, around the country. I think many, if you polled many people in the country, they'd be surprised to learn these massive gaps in protection of the law. Um, so it would solve those problems um, for the most basic things. It would also add things like no discrimination in jury service. Some jurisdictions and some lawyers try to kick off queer people from juries when it's a right to serve on a jury. Um, so it would protect jury service as well, um, as well as all of these other areas of law. Okay, so that's, um, that's the bad news. Um, and we're gonna take an interlude and have some good news for a minute. And then we're gonna kind of circle back and talk about the bad news again. But then I wanna try to, try to end on a, on, a, on a note of hope and, and maybe joy. So stick with me. Okay, so in 2020, we had a really important case come down from the United States Supreme Court. It was called Employment, uh, Bostock versus Clayton County. And there was three different cases that were all put together by the court. It's called consolidating the cases. Um, and Gerald Bostock and Don Zarder were both gay men who were fired from their jobs once their employer found out they were gay. And then in the middle, you see Amy Stevens. She's a transgender woman who was fired from her job when she wrote a letter to her employer saying, I'm taking my vacation, and when I return, I will be Amy Stevens. I would dress according to the female dress code, and I look forward to you know, reintegrating um, as my true self, um, as a woman. Um, all of them were, were fired. And there is a federal law. It's called Title VII. And it's been around uh, since 1964. It's part of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. And it says this, it shall be an unlawful employment practice for an employer to do one of these things, which essentially say, you can't not hire me, you can't fire me, uh, you can't discriminate against me uh, in terms of my compensation or the terms of my employment. Um, these are all unlawful uh, employment practices because of sex. So since 1964, People who fall under Title VII, which is every employer in America with 15 or more employee, employees, so even down to pretty small employers, are covered by Title VII. So this is national blanket law. Um, that, and it also has other identities too, like race, national origin, color, religion. For our purposes here today, we care about this last bolded clause, because of sex. And the court was asked to consider, does that phrase, because of sex, sweep within it? sexual orientation and gender identity. Because for about, I don't know, almost 20 years, um, LGBTQ um, employees who were fired were bringing suit under Title VII. And they were making arguments that, you know what, sexual orientation and gender identity are kind of like a subset of sex. And so even though the statute doesn't say sexual orientation or gender identity, it should, it should apply to me. It should protect me. And courts were split until 2020 when the United States Supreme Court held in favor of these plaintiffs and interpreted this statute's language because of sex to include SOGI. So a very big win here. Um, and this was the question that the court was addressing. And before I talk for just a minute about um, how they got there, right, how did they read SOGI into sex, I want to stop for just a minute and talk about these three plaintiffs. Um, and I do this with my law students, too, because in law school we just read page after page after page of books, right? And I have to remind my students that law is about people, and law is about people's lives. And so I want to talk about Don Zarda and Amy Stevens for just a second, um, if nothing else, to honor, honor their lives, because neither of them survived to see the Supreme Court victory. And Don Zarda was a skydiving instructor. Skydiving was his passion. It was his life. He loved it. And he was discovered to be gay one time because he um, did the kind of skydiving where you strap the client on and you do like a tandem dive with the, with the client. And so he and another instructor were um, getting ready to go up in the plane uh, with a heterosexual couple. And Don Zarda was going to be strapping the woman client on. And he was on the ground joking with the guy saying, oh, don't worry, you know, no, no funny business, I'm gay. You know, don't worry when I strap on your girlfriend, it's going to be fine. And that, that other, the male client reported that he was gay to the employer and he was fired. Um, he was devastated, right? This was his life, his passion, his love. And so he um, 
he started base jumping. And if you don't know what that is, it's like not jumping out of a plane, it's jumping off a rock that you hope is high enough that you can deploy your, your, your parachute before you hit the ground. And um, he developed depression and anxiety um, and was taking riskier and riskier base jumps and died in a tragic base jump accident, um, which the through line back to his termination on his sexual orientation is indisputable. Um, Amy Stevens um, had uh, some health issues, and when she was working for her employer as a man, she was had great health coverage. Um, she worked for a funeral home, and um, after she was fired, um, she lost her health insurance, and some of the medication and medical intervention she needed uh, constantly, right, to sustain her health and keep her alive, she no longer had access to. Um, and so she was able to attend the oral argument for this case, but a few, I think a few weeks before the court um, issued the decision, she passed away from health complications that she needn't have passed away from at that point, but she had lost her health insurance because she had lost her job because of the discrimination. So law is about people um, as well as about, you know, principles of equality and justice and, and all of those really important things. Um, okay, so this is what the, 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 the country looked like before we had the Bostock decision. Um, you can see the patchwork here, um, and the dark is where uh, you would be protected uh, from discrimination in employment based on your sexual orientation. But a wide swath of the country, right, the cream colored, you could be fired for being um, lesbian, gay, or bisexual before Bostock. This is what the map looked like before Bostock for uh, gender identity. And you can see those dark green states are where you could live and still keep a job uh, for being a transgender employee. But the light colored states, you could be terminated for being transgender. Okay. And so Bostock comes down, and this is a beautiful thing, right? Now Title VII protects sexual orientation and gender identity across the country. You can't be you know, fired or failed to be hired or um, yeah, demoted or paid less or any of those things based on SOGI as long as your employer falls under Title VII, which as I say, 15 or uh, more employees, you fall in it. So what falls below the cracks, through the cracks of Title VII and Bostock are really the mom and pop shops, right? With 14 or fewer employees. In that instance, you still have to rely on state law and you'll still have that patchwork of protection. Um, okay, more good news is, um, and this is a mixed bag, but we'll start with the good news, um, is Title IX. And some of you may be familiar with Title IX, you're on a college campus. Um, it is 37 words, that's the entire law you see right there on the slide. And it essentially says that no one in the US on the basis of sex shall be denied educational opportunities. And this applies to nearly every school in the United States, even private schools. Because if any one student gets any one dollar of federal financial aid, Title IX applies to that school. And so it is a sweeping civil rights uh, 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 law uh, that was from 1972. Um, that many people, I think, if you ask on the street, do you know Title IX? And if they do, they're gonna say, that's about sports, right? It's about creating women's sports teams and things like that. That's true, that's one of its great impacts. But it also opened the doors to law schools and medical schools and undergraduate schools that were only men before 1972. It also covers things like um, professor to student harassment or sexual assault and peer to peer sexual assault and harassment. So it's way more than sports. And it's about having an opportunity to learn in an environment where everyone is safe and we can't have discrimination on the basis of sex. Um, so you might notice that on the basis of sex is somewhat similar to Title VII, which said because of sex. And so for many years, courts that were interpreting Title IX in the context of school law often borrowed cases from Title VII because the protections are so similar that the rationale applies. And so the question after Bostock, which said, well, sex discrimination is, sex or sexual orientation discrimination is a type of sex discrimination, some lower courts now are saying that same rationale applies to Title IX because the statutory language isn't that different. The goals of both statutes are the same. And so we've had some good, positive um, lower federal courts saying that we're reading the Bostock case in the employment context to use the same rationale in the school setting for Title IX. Therefore, discrimination based on SOGI in school settings is sex discrimination and is barred by Title IX. This is good. What we're fighting over often is this, the treatment of transgender students in particular, right? It is a lot less controversial to, um, for example, have a bullying policy about sexual orientation than it is to say 
transgender students will use the restroom that aligns with their gender identity. Right? There's th that's, that's more controversial, more contested. Um, I and many others think Title IX covers all of it and that transgender students need to be treated according to their gender identity for every single purpose in school. Uh, and I think eventually I will be vindicated. <laughs> but this is, this is a, a, a contested terrain right now. Um, and this is Lindsay Hecox. She is a uh, cross-country runner from Idaho who sued um, under an anti-trans law there um, and won uh, up into the Ninth Circuit, of, uh, which is a, a court of appeals um, in the federal system, uh, who agreed that, um, uh, that, she, uh, th that the law was un unconstitutional, um, uh, sex discrimination against, against her. Um, that is still a preliminary holding, so it's a stay tuned kind of thing around what eventually will happen to things like um, sex segregated spaces, sex segregated uh, sports teams, and this is certainly something we can dive much deeper in um, on in, in the Q&A. Um, because I could talk for an hour just, just about this. Um, so definitely some good news. Um, okay. More good news. There's something called conversion therapy, which is a misnomer because um, it's not really therapy at all. If you ask anybody who uh, is in the mental health world uh, that is from, uh, has been trained uh, in, a, in a reputable program, um, largely what these, pro what these programs say that they will do is they will say to parents, of queer children, we can fix your queer child, whether they're trans, non-binary, LGBTQ, whatever it is. Um, and largely, these parents are putting these kids in this um, therapy to change their sexual orientation or gender identity, which again, all best evidence says you cannot do, and an effort to do so is deeply, deeply damaging um, to the children themselves. Um, adults who choose this, that's fine, right? But what these laws are targeting are they're saying um, that they're banning conversion therapy for 18 and under so that they're not available anymore for parents to stick their children into. Um, and so we, you can see the dark green is where we've got bans on conversion therapy for minors. This is a good thing because of the deep, deep harm, lasting harm, um, including driving some children to try to take their own lives uh, because they're trying to be told that they're not with who they are. Um, Sadly, we're seeing some of these bans being challenged by the providers themselves in saying this law is unconstitutional because I have a right to free speech under the First Amendment and your state law telling me I can't talk to a client about converting their sexual orientation or gender identity butts up against the First Amendment. And courts have split on that, the lower courts. So that's another stay tuned um, kind of, uh, of question, uh, but it is one that's being actively litigated. The other problem with these laws, they are wonderful in the, in the extent that they are protecting children, but they only apply to licensed therapists, licensed social workers, clinical psychologists, psychiatrists, those kinds of things. They don't apply, for example, to pastoral counseling, which is often where a lot of this conversion therapy happens, in church basements, right, with pastors. And so these bans don't cover that. So there's a gap in that coverage for children who many of whom are still in particular communities being forced into faith-based conversion therapy. And even if they're in a state with a ban, that wouldn't apply to faith-based conversion therapy. Um, so those children are still at risk. All right, I wanna turn now to anti-trans legislation, which is um, the biggest push that the religious right and the likes of the Alliance Defending Freedom are working on these days. Um, so far this year, there's been 533 anti-trans bills introduced over 41 states in this country, and it's only March. Uh, you know, there's still a couple of months left in some legislative sessions. Just yesterday, my state of Kansas passed a ban on gender-affirming care. Uh, which I'm hopeful that my governor will veto when it gets to her desk. Almost all of these bills are aimed at youth, at children. Uh, not all of them, but most of them. So we see bans on gender-affirming care. We see um, bans on trans girls playing uh, on girls' sports teams in K-12 through and college uh, teams. Um, we see um, curricular laws um, where, uh, don't say gay laws, for example, or um, we also see in schools that are equality-minded, there are many school districts in this, in this country now that have affirmative policies about supporting trans kids. They're wonderful. They say things like um, trans kids should be uh, treated according to their gender identity. That means pronouns, that means names, all of that. 
Some teachers are challenging those inclusive policies, saying, I have a First Amendment right under the religious, so the First Amendment right to free religion and the First Amendment right to free speech, that my faith teaches me there's two sexes and they're defined at birth and they can never be changed. And so forcing me to gender a transgender person with the wrong pronoun is a violation of my First Amendment speech rights and religious, religious rights. So we're seeing some pushback from individual teachers in lawsuits. Um, there's a split in authority on that too. The lower federal courts are split on that. And um, the Supreme Court has been asked to take a case uh, to, to determine um, this, this pronoun uh, policy issue. Um, okay. And um, then bans on um, kind of sex segregated spaces more generally, restrooms, locker rooms, um, those kinds of things. Um, so. This is brewing, um, and it is something we can talk more deeply about um, in the Q&A as well. Um, okay, I want to talk a little bit about, um, very briefly, about the anti-trans sports bills. You can see here there are 24 states that have banned um, trans girls, trans girls only, um, from competing on girls' sports teams. Um, these, these, these laws don't touch trans boys, um, and, and we could talk about that and the gender stereotyping around that, um, if you're curious about um, thinking more about that during the Q&A. Um, these are being challenged. Some of them have been um, enjoined by court, and all that means is that the court has put a timeout on enforcing them because challengers have come in and said, you know what, when we get our day in court, we're going we're gonna to beat down this law. It is unconstitutional sex discrimination uh, to tell trans girls they cannot play on girls' sports teams. Um, and some courts have said, I think you might be right. I'm going to put a timeout on the law until we can fully brief and argue these issues. So some of them have been not put into force yet, but some of them have been allowed to proceed. Okay, I think they are fatally flawed, legally speaking, these anti-trans sports bills. I think they violate Title IX, which we've already talked about uh, a little bit, um, and the Equal Protection Clause, uh, which again, I'm, gonna, I'm doing this drive-by, and we can revisit anything that you're interested in hearing more about um, when we get through all of it. Bans on gender-affirming care are growing by the day and the week. Um, the, dark the dark states here are where we do have bans on gender-affirming care. Um, it's interesting because uh, when, when we have don't say gay laws, which we're going to get to in a minute, um, most state legislatures and governors that support these don't say gay laws in schools, meaning you know you can't talk about LGBTQ history, you can't have Mo Heather has two mommy books in your library. These la lawmakers are saying we need to protect parents' rights. Parents should have the right about what their kid learns about sexual orientation and gender identity when and through what context, right? So parents' rights is where it's at when we're trying to ban books. You might think that a parent choosing what proper medical care is for their child would be a very kind of I don't know, mainstream parents' rights issue, right? That parents should have the right to decide the medical care that their children get. So it's interesting that the, the, the religious right and, and the conservative movement who are passing both book bans and gender-affirming care bans, when it's convenient for them, it's about parents' rights. But when it's really about parents' rights, they don't talk about parents' rights uh, in the healthcare context um, there. So one of them purports to protect parents' rights and the other actually takes parents' rights away. Um, okay, so these medical care bans are also devastating for the children, particularly when they're receiving care and then uh, a statute is passed and they have, the family has to make a decision. Are they going to leave the state to continue the care or are they going to try to stay in the state and terminate the care? Um, and the, uh, the statistics around suicidal um, ideation uh, attempts and, and successful attempts are extremely high when trans kids can't get the care that they need. I think these are also fatally flawed as a matter of constitutional law. Um, and for the reasons that, that I lay out here, both under the First and the Fourteenth Amendment, I think they will eventually fall. But again, there's so much harm done in the conversation about it and in the legal fight to push it back. And the lives that we lose along the way um, will never be, uh, be recovered. Don't say gay laws have not proliferated as much as the gender-affirming care bans, uh, but again, they largely are curricular laws um, that say certain materials can't be in schools, uh, can't be discussed in schools. Um, 
Notably, there are some states, mostly on the West Coast over there in Colorado, the dark green, where the state law requires LGBTQ history to be taught, requires queer, uh, queer studies, right, to be integrated into the curriculum. Uh, but the others um, uh, are ones that are saying you cannot talk about these things um, at all. Uh, here is Florida's law, and it says this. It says classroom instruction by school personnel or third parties on sexual orientation or gender identity may not occur in kindergarten through grade three or in a manner that is not age appropriate or developmentally appropriate for students in accordance with state standards. Not one, not one word there says gay, says lesbian, says queer, says non-binary, says trans, right? Doesn't say that. It just says sexual orientation or gender identity. So when there was a challenge to this in court, the, legislate, the state, when they were trying to defend it, said, this isn't anti-LGBT. It doesn't say LGBT anywhere there, right? But we all know what it means, right? Um, because some teachers were like, wait a minute, we can't talk at all about like sexual orientation. Does that mean, um, let's say that you have a straight woman teacher, is she allowed to say, if, if a kid says to her, what did you do this weekend? Is she allowed to say, well, my husband and I went to the farmer's market? That seems like it would be talking about sexual orientation, but we know that's not what they mean, right? They, they don't mean that. Um, they mean queer. Um, I will report that since I made this slide, just in the last couple of days, there's been a settlement reached in the Florida case uh, that largely ameliorates the largest problems. Um, it allows gay-straight alliances to come back in. It doesn't ban any books from the library anymore. It allows organic conversations to happen in the classroom. So for example, if a, if a kid has two moms, um, they can talk about their two moms in the classroom and not get in trouble under the law. Um, there's still some problematic aspects, but a large part of that settlement is, 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 is positive. Um, uh, and I think they settled because they knew that uh, this would probably be stricken. It had been already enjoined by a court as potentially unconstitutional. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, but all of these, uh, the basis uh, of the challenges, I think, are, are good ones. Um, and uh, we'll see if the other states kind of that have these are going to proceed through um, litigating them uh, out. You know, we've seen this before, um, which is another thing. I think we've got a short historical memory in our country. Clearly, we do around not just this issue, but uh, let's start with slavery. Um, but this has happened before in the 90s. There was a whole slew of laws around the country that were called no promo homo laws back then, rather than don't say gay. Um, and it was the same, you know, same thing, just different era. Uh, and so there were many, many challenges, um, successful challenges to those, and I anticipate further successful challenges um, to these um, today. Okay, and then we have some bans on drag shows. Um, at this point, there's only three, Tennessee, Montana, and Florida. Um, and they have been enjoined, like we have put a timeout on them because they really are so contrary to the First Amendment. It's, it's laughable that they even got passed. Um, but again, part of the campaign by the religious right isn't so much to ultimately have these stay on the books. It's about asserting power, trying to um, recreate norms and what's fair game to talk about and to try to litigate. Um, and to force advocacy groups on the queer side to expend the resources to litigate these things for years and years and years. Uh, meanwhile, moving the conversation to what might have been radical a, a generation ago to normalizing these conversations of the contesting of lives uh, of LGBTQ people. Um, okay, so let's turn to public accommodations laws. Uh, these are um, laws that you probably don't even think about because there's so much a background norm in our, in our country these days. A public accommodation is everything from a restaurant to a doctor's office to a hair salon. Um, anywhere you go shopping, Starbucks, Walmart, you name it, are public accommodations. If you hang your shingle in the public marketplace, you are a public accommodation. And most states, uh, many states, about, I don't know, tw the, the dark green ones, I'd say about 20-ish states, um, have public accommodations laws on their books that include a whole host of kind of customers you can't turn away, it's race, gender, sex. Um, sometimes it's pregnancy status, it's a whole host of things depending on the state. But some of them protect against sexual orientation discrimination in the marketplace. So it says right there in the state law, you can't turn away people that are customers just because they're gay. 
Um, and so we have in these states that have protections for queer customers, this is where we see this, these um, religious exemption claims come up. We see wedding vendors in particular saying that, hey, I understand. Colorado, for example, has a state law that says you can't turn away LGBTQ customers. But if I follow that law as a traditional Christian baker, then my First Amendment rights will be violated. So I get an excuse or an exemption from the law that everybody else has to follow because of my faith and the First Amendment protection of my faith and my speech. And so here's the arguments that they make to try to get an exemption from the general law. They say, first of all, if you make me sell the wedding cake to the gay couple, that is the government forcing me to speak a message. And there is clear law that the government can't make you say a message, right? You get to choose your own messages. Well, here that's a little bit of a leap, most scholars and lawyers would say. Like, what is the message that you're saying the government is making you send? The, mo the best I can come up with is, I'm a law-abiding person, like, I'm just following the law. These vendors would say, no, the, the, the state is forcing me to say I adopt and celebrate gay marriage, um, which is never before how anti-discrimination law has been understood. But this is how it's being framed now. They also say, well, there's a really bright law on the Constitution, which is right, that you have the right to be free from being compelled to speak someone else's message. And so they argue, well, if it's not the government speech that's being compelled for me, then it's definitely the couple's speech. If you force me to sell the cake to the couple, then you are forcing me to express their message, which is gay marriage is great. Well, that's also a new way of thinking about anti-discrimination law, because if you see a wedding cake at a same-sex wedding or any wedding, whose message do you think, I mean, it, it, are you attributing it to the baker? Or are you saying, oh, this is the couple's message, right? Most people think they attribute any message to the customer, not to the person who sold it, if you even know who sold, right, the wedding good. Um, so that attribution piece is just not one that we usually think about in the way that the wedding vendors are trying to think about it. Um, and then they make uh, free exercise of religion arguments, saying, if you make me follow the law and sell the cake to the gay couple, then that violates my right to exercise my religion, and the, the First Amendment is, holds that dear. Um, these are the claims that they're putting forward. Um, now, I will note that in 1964, after the Civil Rights Act was passed, which includes a federal public accommodations law, we saw a handful of cases in the South where white vendors, mostly barbecue joints, were saying, I don't want to serve black people. And you know why? Because if I comply with the Civil Rights Act, it violates the First Amendment. It violates my free exercise. It violates my free speech. And you know what the court said? That's patently frivolous. That's the word that the United States Supreme Court used, which is you can have all the beliefs you want about whether the races should mix, whether, that, whether black people are equal to white people. You can believe that till the cows come home. But this is about conduct. It's telling you what you do when you hang a shingle. It's about regulating conduct, not regulating speech. You sell barbecue, you sell it to everybody. And you can go on and talk all you want about racial relations, but this is about conduct, not about speech. Uh, and that has been enforced since 1964 without exception, without exception. And so today, thinking about, because one of the arguments in these cases is, well, if you allow a, ve a vendor to turn away a gay couple, then why wouldn't you allow them to turn away an interracial straight couple? It's still the same religious faith-based, you know, argument. And people say, oh, that won't happen anymore. You know, race-based discrimination won't happen. And if they do say, well, my religion tells me that the races shouldn't mix, that's just racism, not religion. Well, no, courts aren't in the business of parsing through whose religious beliefs are good and whose are bad. That's not the role of the court, right? And so the reason it seems for many of us ridiculous that today a wedding vendor would say, I'm not going to sell a wedding cake to a straight interracial couple is because for like 60 years we've implied the anti-discrimination law without exception, right? We have to do it without exception or else we have slippage and slippage and it's hard to draw a line of where you're going to say, no, you got to sell to that group but not to this group. Um, and so keeping consistent is really important. Okay, I'm quickly going to talk about three cases, and then I'm going to stop and open it up. Because the U.S. Supreme Court has heard three cases since 2018, all of them seeking religious exemptions from public accommodations laws. And notwithstanding 
my great briefing in the court, uh, as well as um, the position of, of anti-discrimination law up until this time, they held for the vendor in all three cases. So we've seen a chipping away since 2018 of public accommodations laws. Okay, so this is a case from Colorado where a baker didn't want to sell a cake to, uh, to a gay couple. And even though Colorado law says you've got to sell to a gay couple. Um, and so he went through all of the process of fighting the charges, uh, one of which was before you go to a real judge in a court, there's an administrative body called the Civil Rights Commission. And that's a step along the way. You've got to do the Civil Rights Commission before you get a right to go to court. So the baker went to the Civil Rights Commission, and there was nine commissioners there who were acting as judges to give a recommendation. And a couple of them at a public hearing said things like, when you enter the marketplace, you have to kind of sell to everyone. You can't use religion as an excuse. Another one said something along the lines of, you know, historically, religion's been used like to justify things like the Holocaust and slavery. And it's like, it's despicable to use religion to, 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 to justify discrimination. And so that, those comments, which the US Supreme Court held were evidence of religious hostility, that's the reason the US Supreme Court held for the baker. They said he didn't get a fair shake at the process. They never actually answered the real constitutional question, which is, does the First Amendment require an exemption from public accommodations law? They left that gaping open. They just said, this one guy here didn't get a fair trial. So because it was hostility from the government about religion, his free exercise rights were violated. But they left open the question everybody cares about, right? This guy just got a procedural win. But still, it kept open the conversation about this question. Fast forward to 2021. We're moving away from wedding vendors, and we're talking about a foster care agency called Catholic Social Services. It's one of about 30 in Philadelphia that helped to go into homes of potential foster families to certify them, to say, yep, they meet the statutory requirements. Clean home, safe home, those kinds of things, right? They can now be in the pool of foster parents. So the city of Philadelphia has a contract with, with all of their uh, agencies. CSS is one of them. And in that, there's a provision that says you can't reject a family based on their sexual orientation. Right? It's a non-discrimination clause in the contract. There's also something, a, a local public accommodations law. It's not the whole state, but the city of Philadelphia says you can't turn people away because they're gay, among other things. So we've got a law and a contract. Both of them have non-discrimination clauses in them. Well, Catholic Social Services says we believe that marriage is a sacred bond between a man and a woman. So we want to be exempt from the city's law, and we also want to be not having to follow the contract provision. So this goes all the way up to the Supreme Court. One notable thing, as you can see in the white box there, we have the general non-discrimination provision in the contract, but there's also an exception. It says, well, we can maybe get away from Section 321 if the commissioner in their discretion gives you an exemption. OK, so this, this uh, they come out and they say they're not going to certify same-sex couples. The contract is terminated. Catholic Social Services sues, it goes all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court, and the U.S. Supreme Court fines for Catholic Social Services. Again, in a kind of narrow way. First of all, they say, an a, um, a, a, a agency like this, a foster care agency, is not a public accommodation, right? You don't think of it like, you just don't walk off the street uh, into a foster care agency, right, like you do a Starbucks. So. I think it's arguable, but that's what they did, because they didn't want to have to deal with that other question again, right, of whether the First Amendment will allow exemptions from general laws. So they're like, oh, we can just punt that again and just say a foster care agency is not a public accommodation. So that took that off the table. So all they had to focus on was the contract. And they said that, yeah, we have this provision over here that says you can't discriminate based on sexual orientation, but the fact that the city might give an exemption, that alone is enough to say essentially the reasoning was an exemption for one person means you have to give an exemption to all. And this is notwithstanding that no one had ever asked for an exemption, no one, none had ever been given at all, but the mere fact that the court held that that provision was no longer generally applicable because of the opportunity to maybe get an exemption from somebody at some point made it not generally applicable. And if it's not generally applicable to everybody, then you can't treat religious exemption seekers worse than you would a secular one. Okay. So again, kind of in the weeds on this particular, um, and, and what, what could happen here is right, the, the, the city could go back and just take the exception out, and we still have the question come back again. right? So it was another kind of sidestep 
of this larger question of does the First Amendment allow people to pick and choose the law they follow if they don't want to uh, comply when it comes to queerness, right? When it comes to queerness. Um, okay, last case, just came out last summer, um, the worst of the lot. Uh, this was another Colorado case. It was a website vendor. She, was, she hadn't even started her wedding website business yet, um, but she was afraid if she did, a same-sex couple might come to her who she'd then have to turn away, and then Colorado would come after her. So this was unusual because usually when you go to the Supreme Court, you have to actually have had a legal injury. It's called standing. You can't just go to court and say, like, can you give me an advisory opinion about m what might happen if I start a website? Right? You have to have an actual controversy, actual harm. None of that happened here. But yet, this went all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court, and the court found she had standing in a way that was remarkably inconsistent with anything else they've ever held on that issue. Um, and... Uh, what happened in this case was the, the state of Colorado and the wedding vendor here um, agreed um, to a set of facts. They're called stipulations, and you can do this in civil litigation. They say, let's agree for, this, for the case of resolution of this case. Here's 20 facts we agree on. And one of the facts that the, the state of Colorado decided to agree on was that any words she wrote on this website would be pure speech, which is interesting. There's something called commercial speech, which is a better fit, I think, for commercial speech. Um, but also they agreed in their stipulations that any speech she wrote on this would be her speech, not the customer's speech. Very unusual to concede that in stipulations. And I, I would love to sit down with the Attorney General of Colorado and basically say, what were you thinking? Because the Supreme Court used those stipulations as the basis for finding that Colorado's uh, public accommodations law cannot be applied to her when it comes to her websites. This is a massive massive exception that has just been cut out of public accommodations laws and I don't know how limit how I mean there has to be some words it has to be some kind of expressive item but there's a lot of expressive items especially when it comes to weddings calligraphers those kinds of things and so this case turned anti-discrimination law on its head by saying that anti-discrimination law regulates speech because as I said before it regulates conduct. It says you must sell your products to everyone. It has never, ever, ever been uh, characterized as regulating speech. In fact, even when you have expressive products, the court in the past has said any burden on speech is incidental, right? It's just incidental to the conduct we're regulating, which is when you hang a shingle in the square, you have to follow the law. So this is an open question about the harm that it's going to do. Justice Gorsuch seems to think that this is not a big deal because a whole host of like wedding products will never be touched by this. But I think it's there's different there's really difficult line drawing that's going to have to be done on this. Um, and to me, this is the most worrying of the three of the trilogy that the court um, uh, came up with in the last three years around this. And it all goes back to those stipulations. If they hadn't stipulated that, then we would have gone down a totally different analytical path about conduct regulation instead of speech regulation, which is why I want to take the Attorney General from Colorado out back and ask some tough questions of him. Um, okay, let's see here. So that's where we are. That was a lot. Um, and like I say, we can unpack any of it that you want to in the Q&A. But given the state of play, which has some positives but a lot of negatives, um, and, and this, this queer stuff is just one part of what scholars, and I agree, are calling the white Christian nationalism movement, um, which has really taken over the United States Supreme Court and attacked things not just like queer rights, but voting rights, voter suppression, regulatory rights, like the Environmental Protection Agency. They're trying to undo that so that we can't regulate clean air anymore. These are all pieces that, unless you kind of step back and see the through line, um, they're all connected. Um, and so it is, a, it is a dark time, not just for queer people, but for anyone um, who cares about things like equality, democracy, um, and the environment. Um, but, okay, so what can you do in these dark times? Here are some things you can do. You can come to things like this and educate yourself. You can go to law school. The University of Kansas is outstanding, and I would love to talk to you about that afterwards if you have any interest at all in law school. Um, you can speak out. When you see discrimination, speak out about it. Um, use your voice. Write letters to elected officials. You can support queer organizations, either by volunteering, or if you've got the money, you can donate, or you can do both of those things. Voting, I cannot stress enough how important it is to vote, particularly in this upcoming 
presidential election, but vote for pro-LGBTQ candidates. Support queer-owned businesses. I also want to take a minute and talk about joy. There's a, a, a little micro-movement in Kansas or in the trans community about queer and trans joy in Kansas. There's a, a, a video series that the ACLU of Kansas made about trans joy, where it just shows trans people living in moments of joy. And I am so behind this because joy is an act of resistance, right? Love is an act of resistance. In these kinds of times, coming together and challenging dominant narratives, right? The dominant, do, dominant narratives are trans and queer people live lonely lives, right? We pathologize uh, their lives. They're depressed. They're outcasts. And if we flip that script and show healthy, happy, joyful queer people, it's a powerful act of resistance to resist marginalization you know, in the face of systemic marginalization, starting at the high court and going all the way down to state legislatures. Um, it challenges the idea, if we live with joy, it challenges the idea that we have to live in shame and secrecy. And that is so powerful. It affirms, it affirms the beauty of our lives. It affirms the value of our lives. Um, and it can be a form of collective resistance. Uh, and so the, the living with joy is a, is a big thing on my mind these days. Um, and then last but not least, um, and I'll, I'll provide this, uh, this PowerPoint, because each of these is hyperlinked in, 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 in the uh, version of the PowerPoint. These are all organizations that I rely on, that I know people in, that I trust to be uh, grappling with the hard issues, um, taking the right stances, um, and doing the work uh, to get us to hopefully where we can say uh, liberty and justice for all, because we're not quite there yet. So I'm going to stop there and take any questions. Yes. 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 Uh huh. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the question was, um, it appears that the Roberts Court is just legally ignorant. Um, and I would say if that's true, it's willful ignorance. Uh, and um, yes, because since the Trump appointees have taken the bench, there's been a shift in norms at the court, right? So like norms like um, there's a principle in law called stare decisis. And all that means is that if there is a, if there's a case that's decided, you don't just overturn it willy-nilly, right? Like, we need coherence in the law. We don't just can't come in and say, well, one court says X, oh, five years later there's another court, let's say Y, right? You keep precedent unless there's a really good reason to reverse something, right? And so um, adherence to the doctrine of stare decisis is a big reason that the court is legitimate in our society, right? The only thing that gives legitimacy the court to the court is us, right? We just happen to follow the decisions that they put down, and we do that, at least until now, and hopefully we will continue to if they can get their act together, but we do that because there is a logical, systemic way of thinking about when do we overturn precedent. 
And of course, sometimes precedent needs to be overturned, like you know the decision that uh, African Americans are three fifths of a person. Like that is a anti equality decision that should be overturned. But when we saw the overturn of Roe versus Wade, in re and the, the court kind of went through the factors of that, should we go ahead and, and reverse this? They did it in a way that was really specious, in a, in a way that wasn't very meaningful. Um, and so that was the first indicator that this this whole notion that we abide by precedent unless there's a really compelling reason to not, that went out the window. So once stare decisis is out the window as a linchpin of how we make law, standing is like a, we can blow right through that, right? And so it's, it's really troubling, it's really troubling. Um, and there's a lot of legal scholars thinking about this problem. Um, and unless you are a, Thinking about this a lot, I think it could be hard to kind of understand the scope of it all as just a, a lay person in the world. So we need more lawyers, and uh, you can help to be a translator uh, for what's going on here. Yeah. I saw another hand, I thought. Yes. Yes, I can speak more about the book bans. Um, like I say, luckily we haven't seen as an uptick in those as we have, like with the gender affirming care. Um, but you know, this harkens back to it harkens back to like a McCarthyism almost, right? And so, a lot of this we see history kind of repeating itself. Um, and so, for the same reasons that those kind of McCarthy esque uh, of censor laws really uh, were unconstitutional, I mean, I think very plainly these book bans are. I mean, I just don't know that there's any way. And, and uh, any way that the Supreme Court could uphold them, um, because they're so far afield of really established, entrenched First Amendment principles. Um, and where do you draw that line? Like, who gets to decide what the content is, right? And at some point, hopefully, the balance of power would shift on these school boards, right? And so the people who are making, trying to ban gay books now, you know, they should be careful what they do, because if the balance of power ever shifts to others, that don't share their views, maybe those will try to weaponize what they did and try to ban, I don't know, conservative type books, right? And so we don't want to be in that kind of a place, right? Um, so I, I don't think there's a legal leg to stand on under the First Amendment. Um, but I also didn't expect this court to do the things they're doing. So I can't say that with as much confidence as I could even 18 months ago. Yeah, Do Dobbs, the, the overturning of Roe was very, uh, disorienting, disruptive, and destabilizing. And not just for reproductive rights, but for like how we make law in this country. Um, it was extremely destabilizing. Yeah. try to go back and see just to make sure I'm tracking. Um, so it would have been this one, right? Right. Okay. Um, so yeah, I mean, doctors, um, if, the, if the government passes a law that says you can't talk about certain things, uh, and by saying you can't provide gender-affirming care essentially says to doctors you can't talk about it, um, the government has to show a compelling reason to do that. It's a very high standard. And um, they have to show what's called a compelling government interest for for uh, quashing speech. Um, and I don't know what that compelling interest would be, right? I mean, a lot of these bans on gender affirming care are based on junk science. Um, any reputable doctor will tell you gender affirming care is best practice. And it's been going on for over 60 years with no harm to children. And so often it's like, this is harmful to children because it's experimental. That's usually the government interest that's put forward. Um, first of all, that is. Um, wrong as a matter of fact, but even, um, and is not exper experimental uh, under what we think about experimental, experimental drugs under the FDA. Um, so that, that's how it intersects with speech. So does, that, does that help on that one? Um, and then, okay, so the 14th Amendment Equal Protection Clause that basically says um, you can't kind of classify uh, based on sex, for example, and treat men better than women. That's what the, the Equal Protection Clause says. And so when it comes to gender affirming care, I think many people think about things like surgical interventions, like top surgery, bottom surgery. It's not just that, and in fact, 
the uh, World Organization that, that comes up with the best practices for, for trans people says no surgical interventions before the age of 18. So that's not what we're talking about when we're talking about gender affirming care for kids. We are not talking about surgery. What we're talking about mostly is when puberty starts to hit, administering puberty blockers, which is just basically putting a timeout on puberty so that they don't have to go through um, puberty in the wrong sex and have that dysphoria that might result if they're a boy and then they grow breasts. The dysphoria is, is very, very damaging. And so the puberty blockers are 100% reversible. All you gotta do is go off them and then you go through normal puberty. And so it is a literally a timeout to give the kid time, even years, to work with therapists, work with parents, figure out who they are. And if they are, they persist in their transgender identity, which many of them do, then they will continue on those until they reach the age of later teenagerhood where they might start taking cross-sex hormones, testosterone if they're a, tra a trans boy, and start to develop secondary sex characteristics of boys. And then when they get to 18, they can do that, right? Okay, so that's general. But also things like gender affirming care would be things like nose jobs, that's gen gender affirming care, breast reduction. I'm talking for cisgender girls and cisgender boys. And so what we're saying is, well, you, so you allow gender affirming care for girls who are cis. They can have nose jobs and breast reductions or breast augmentations. All that's gender affirming care. You're saying it's okay for cisgender girls but not transgender girls. That's sex discrimination. And that's, that's, that's the, the, the middle bullet there. It's not, you can't do it under the 14th Amendment. It's, it violates equal protection. And then there's a long line of cases for the U.S. Supreme Court from the 14th Amendment. It also has something called a due process clause. Um, and that protects things not just like, do they get a fair trial, but there's like a substantive component um, to, it's called substantive due process. Um, and the court has held over and over that parents have a fundamental right under the Constitution to direct the upbringing of their children, including making medical decisions. And so when the state says to a parent, you can't get your kid puberty blockers, that like comes straight up against the fundamental right to parent. And so it's a violation of a fundamental right. And if that's, if that, if the court buys that, which I think they will, um, again, the, the state would have to show a compelling government interest in trying to take away a fundamental right from a parent. And I don't think they can do it in this instance. Yes. Yes, um, Quentin is a friend of mine. He used to be on the faculty at KU, and he's awesome. So I'm glad you gave him a shout out, and I'm going to have to let let him know that <laughs> here in the Berkshires he got a shout out. Um, you know, Colorado as a state has said that they're a, a, a sanctuary state, um, and so that's within the province of the local municipality or the state. Um, and it basically says if you are here uh, in Kansas City, um, you will have protective transgender laws. Now, you will have an issue if the state law bans gender affirming care. There's a supremacy there of state law over local law, and so when it conflicts, then we're going to have a problem. So, practically speaking, it doesn't mean that cities can like try to get exempt from state bans. Um, there'll be a lot of legal wrangling around that, so there are some limits to the sanctuary. Uh, the sanctuary city or state concept. You see it in immigration law as well, where people protect um, as sanctuary cities for immigration. Um, so it, ha it does have limits when it butts up against what's called the supremacy clause, either federal or state law. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so trans men versus trans women. Yes, yeah. Right. Um, so, yeah, it's not that they're not cases with trans men. It's just the laws don't even talk about trans men. The law only says trans girls. And so trans boys, I'm so, um, yeah, trans boys are welcome to play on boys' sports teams. And it goes down to a sex stereotype in many ways, which is, you know, if you're a trans girl, right, you were si assigned male at birth and you've transitioned to be a girl, that you are going to have some unfair advantage when you play against cisgender girls. And we don't have that same stereotype about girls who are, uh, people who are assigned girl at birth and then transition to be a boy and play on boys teams. We just think, oh, good luck. 
good luck to that kid, right? And that's a lot about stereotyping, right? Um, so I think that's the basis of it, is just invidious sex stereotyping. Even of, we do that of cisgender people all the time, but we're overlaying invidious sex stereotyping about the abilities of girls and boys on trans kids now as well. And so I think that's a large part of it. Yeah. Yes. Yes, um, the Respect for Marriage Act was actually signed into law by Biden um, in the last six months or so, which, which did two things. One, it said that they were going to take the federal marriage ban off the books. It was still there even after Obergefell, so that's gone. Um, and basically says they're going to respect all state marriages that are gay marriages. Um, but that's just a statute, right? And so the, the Obergefell holding was a constitutional holding that... There's a right to marry, and same-sex couples must become you know, available to them, too. So the Supreme Court could undo Obergefell. Um, and if they do, then it will revert back to states as a matter of statutory law to create that right. And so you know, we had a handful of states do it on their own before we got Obergefell, <coughs> including Massachusetts, 2006. First case, Goodrich. Um, and so it would revert back to the states. And Dobbs gives, the, gives the, the, the grounding to undo Obergefell, because Obergefell, the marriage equality case, you can put a through line back to Roe, because that due process right I was talking about, substantive due process rights, it doesn't say anywhere in the Constitution there's a right to abortion or there's a, you know, a right to gay marriage or even a right to marriage, but the court had read the 14th Amendment due process clause as one that has a substantive component and protects some substantive rights, and one of those rights they talked about was privacy, a right to privacy, and um, a right to autonomy and liberty and dignity. These are big concepts. But in Roe versus Wade, they took those big concepts and said, those big concepts actually apply to women making reproductive health care choices. That's, so, so Roe, the abortion right in Roe, was based in substantive due process, privacy, autonomy, family. Same, the contraception cases, too. Family, autonomy, privacy. You get to Obergefell, you look at the cases they cite to find the right to join marriage, row, uh, family, autonomy, privacy. So Alito says in Roe, I mean, in, in Dobbs, Justice Alito, Alito says, oh, no, don't worry about marriage. Don't worry about sodomy. That's another one, same-sex sodomy. Don't worry about that. We're just talking about abortion here. I'm worried because it's literally the same cases <laughs> that supported abortion and contraception and the right to have same-sex intimate conduct are what underlies Obergefell. And when Roe is dead, all of them can fall very easily. So the question was about the leak of the Dobbs opinion. Um, and so are you wondering if, like, they might start leaking more? Yeah, I guess that's kind of my question. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, that was such a massive breach. And what was surprising to me is some of the most offensive language didn't even change between that and the final opinion. Um, so I don't know that I have a response to that. I hope that I hope the answer is no. Um, because if that, yeah, I mean, it's bad enough as it is. Um, but I hope the answer is no on that. Yeah. yeah. All right, is that was that it? Did I hear that was the last question? Thank you. Thank you.